Hello, 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 hello. Welcome, welcome. Um, uh, today's topic is how to tap into the exploding gaming market. Um, my name is James Bowater, and I'm the panel uh, panel moderator for today. Um, I uh, have a publication in the United Kingdom called Crypto AM, uh, which is part of City AM newspaper. Um, my my pleasure um, to uh, to be invited to uh, moderate this panel uh, by Bowie uh, is uh, also because I've got a side interest in in in, in things where where I am involved with uh, Bose and Protocol, which is uh, doing its thing in the metaverse, and also Cornucopius, uh, a new play to earn game uh, being built on the Cardano network. So um, I would like to introduce the panel uh, and perhaps uh, you could, you guys could uh, say uh, some words about yourselves and then we'll get to some questions. How is about that? Excellent. So James from Animoca, how are you? Great, great. Thanks for having us. Thanks, James. Uh, quick intro. So I, I work for the um, uh, Animoca, uh, which is one of the early sort of um, uh, believers in NFTs. Uh, my role here really uh, focuses on looking at um, deal flow investments uh, and it really evolved into partnerships and ecosystems. So have a good peripheral view on some of our investment pieces uh, and some of the key trends that we're seeing across the, the market and blockchain development, including gaming and infrastructure. Brilliant. Julian Sahar, Saha, is that how I pronounce your name, sir? Yeah, you, you're right there. Thank you. Uh, Julian, you're from B Digital Assets. Uh, let's, let's hear about you. Lovely to be here. Um, we work with a lot of um, uh, high net worth individuals and family offices on their um DeFi and metaverse investment, as well as advising projects in the space. Um, and we're quite a big believer in um, all three things, Web3 and, and, and gaming and the metaverse is certainly onboarding more users into the space. Wonderful. Uh, Sammy Karim, uh, EK Sys Development at the Bind and Smart Chain, I'm guessing. Yes. yes. <laughs> Great to be here. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sami. I'm supporting ecosystem development for Binance Smart Chain. Uh, essentially, we're supporting the developer ecosystem. And today, uh, there's a large game developer community within BSC building a wide variety of different types of games, as well as tooling on top of BSC. And we've seen very significant uh, increase in growth uh, from a number of games being deployed on BSC, driving a lot of adoptions and, and, and new users coming into the ecosystem. Wonderful. Thank you, Sammy. Um, Thomas Koenig uh, from Pixie Interactive uh, in an airport, no less. So um, welcome and brilliant job. For Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, let's hear about you and your Wi-Fi hotspot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first thing I have to say, brilliant pronunciation of my last name there. Uh, that's that, that must have taken a while. Um, nope, I just got a good ear, sir. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Tom. I'm the CEO, co-founder of Pixie Interactive. We're an interact. Or sorry, we're an independent game development studio, uh, and we've sort of taken a direction uh, in integrating blockchain technology into our games, where we uh, are building a principle we call Fun First. Uh, the idea of sort of uh, accepting that the novelty of the blockchain is worn off, push it to the back end, make sure you have actually fun games, and then integrate the play to earn as a secondary thing. And that's what we believe is the future. So uh, that's sort of where I fit into this. Brilliant. Um, and just panel, just remind yourselves to uh, can you please say that um, the team can uh, do, do their thing afterwards. Um, great. So let's get to it. Um, we had a little chat before uh, the panel started. And um, I, for one, uh, have no idea too much about the role of guild. So um, uh, that's uh, your fault, James. So over to you, sir. I think let's start Great, with you. Explain why they are so, so important as opposed to trading firms or to exchange, as, as, as trading other firms or to exchanges. Sorry, I will shut up. Thanks, James. I think um, one of the reasons why we brought this topic up, I think, um, so we're early investors uh, in, in, in some of the, the, the sort of key key sort of players in, in this space, uh, including uh, OpenSea, uh, YGG, and also Axie, we're one of the lead investors. So clearly the, the, the past month has been super exciting in the gaming space because uh, the Sky Mavis team from Axie uh, has proven not only 
uh, can we actually achieve uh, multi-million daily active users? Uh, they've shown that they can do over a billion dollars in on-chain um, transaction volume, which has gotten really excited. Uh, a lot of people may or may not know that one of the key drivers and catalysts towards achieving this one million daily active user is from a company called YGG, uh, with Yield Guild Games from Debbie Design. Uh, so they're huge in terms of they were one of the early sort of drivers when we spoke to Gabby about two years ago when he's designing the model, uh, basically allowed for people to invest in the, the, the axes and start guilds and scholars, uh, allowing them to to rent out their axes uh, for a rep share and competition. And we've seen, he, he recently had a very successful launch on, on Miso, uh, and we've seen his um, token uh, do really well, uh, achieving nearly $9 billion in fully diluted valuation on their token. Uh, but we do think that what he's stepped upon and, and grown is really to open up what the future of potential gaming may look like in terms of how guilds have a fundamental sort of uh, driver to to allow communities to build uh, and ex accessibility to people to earn, uh, you know, a part of the play to earn. Uh, we've seen uh, very quickly that this model be evolving. We've seen over 15 different guilds being built out of China, uh, and some in Singapore, uh, and we're very you know open to sort of understanding uh, how we sort of get involved. And as play to earn sort of matures and we're starting to see, including ourselves as, as developers, how do we sort of need to see the next evolution from Axie? We think that there's going to be tier two games, triple uh, A, double A, that's going to come to play. So I'd love to hear the, the, the group in terms of, you know, how do you guys see you guys getting involved in the guilds? Uh, we're seeing some very interesting ones. And how do you guys participate actively in terms of driving and, and sort of supporting this ecosystem? Who'd like to take that one? Um, look, I, I, I think the guild space is super interesting. Um, and having come from a trading background myself, it's very reminiscent of um, proprietary trading firms backing traders and having relationships with exchanges, which I would say in this case is like the games. Um, the proprietary trading firms or the guilds go and find the games with the you know most um, lucrative opportunities and then direct players um, over towards there. And so you sort of constantly have this swimming around of, of, of um, activity going around and find, finding the most profitable opportunities, um, almost like arbitraging between, between the games. So it sort of drives um, the most productive use of assets as well as more volume within the games, which is kind of, um, you know, professionalizing and um, expanding uh, the whole space. So, it, you know, it, it, it's, quite amazing how so soon into the play to earn um, model, there's already these um, quite reminiscent um, uh, trading firms um, popping up. Can I, can I interject? Because actually I, I find that, I, I, I just find that, that particular um, uh, bit very interesting. I'm just going in my head whilst I remember um, listening to a speech that, you know, attention is the new currency. You know, um, I also like to think that, um, you know, play to earn, um, it's going to certainly give people um, uh, a whole new a whole new avenue. But I just keep hearing things that are going regulation, 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 tax, tax, tax. Is there any sort of government intervention or nationalist intervention, or is this so wonderfully borderless that, that there's just no chance in heaven that, that anyone's going to be able to do anything about it? Or is it going to attract a lot of attention, um, just like DeFi is at the moment? So from my from from Animoca side of things, we're we're very cognizant that regulation needs it, it will come, uh, and we're we're making you know proper investments to 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 stay on top of it, primarily because we think that obviously just acceleration between 2020 and 2021, uh, in terms of the holders of NFT, and also the complexity of what NFTs people are holding and the utility and the value, it's gonna you know you I think um you know I don't think the government cares when there's a dollar NFTs in a million people's pockets, but when it's a million dollars each, they're gonna start caring. Right. And I think um, the second thing is that we're starting to see a custodial becoming very important. You know, when you're holding a million dollar piece of land, you really want to hold in your cold harbor wallet. Uh, when you're holding $10 million piece of land, you want to hold, you know, a people's, you want to hold in your wallet. Right. So custodial regulatory, I think, is going to be very much necessary um, to, to accelerate the market uh, and educate the market as well. Thinking of acceleration, um, one of the things that we touched upon before um, we started recording was, uh, and you say 2021, I mean, there, there is no, there's no mistaking the fact that, um, that, that, that the pandemic and the shutdown has had a, a, an accelerant on digitization, QR codes being now 
the everyday norm. I mean, no, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been exposed to that space for many, many years, but um, it, it was more of a novelty. Now it's a necessity. Um, do you do, do you feel that that in a sense, rather like SARS was back in the day, that it created Alibaba and things like that? That, that basically that the pandemic has led to obviously online learning, um, obviously making sure that people are more compliant and following rules and regulations about travel, which is sort of like that awful social credit thing leading to travel ability when you've got a green light, red light. So escapism is going to be massively important. So I think it's, it, do you find that all of this correlates neatly to an acceleration of play to earn, build to earn and all of this sort of thing? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I think we've seen it on, on our end in the terms of uh, Game Development Studio and, and Axie was mentioned before in the acceleration. Axie has seen over, uh, especially the past six months, but, but honestly, uh, the past year and a half. Um, certainly the fact that uh, a lot of people were quarantined as a result of, of uh, COVID and maybe they were away from their jobs and there was a lot of financial uncertainty, it pushed people into crypto and uh, into blockchain technology as a whole. And it's something we have to be aware of now that it's sort of passing and we're, we're reaching the far end of that quarantine situation. And, and it's going to be interesting to see which way the market develops, whether there is that amount of critical traction you need, especially with, with this recent explosion of Axie, whether you have the critical mass to keep this going once the quarantines go out of effect and people go back to work and do people then uh, essentially either tether uh, all of the money they use for, for Ethereum uh, gas fees or what have you, or do people uh, trade it into something more longer term, Bitcoin, try to move away from using this technology every day. Uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see. I don't think the scholar system is going to go away really anytime soon, uh, as long as it's profitable enough that, you know, there are countries in the world where you do better than a monthly wage if you're playing something like Axie Infinity. And and that's, I mean, that that's all the motivation you need to play the game. But in the, in the more industrialized world, uh, I'm interested to see what happens to the market now that people go back to work. But I think that it's, it, it's, it's, it is true to say, isn't it, that, 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 you know, people's time and attention is worth money and uh, to, to somebody and somewhere. Um, so, yes, I mean, um, uh, Sammy, have you got anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, sure. So I think definitely we've seen as well as many of our peers in the industry that uh, the lockdowns and many of the, the, the kind of the impacts of the the COVID-19 crisis has been a, a really massive driver for accelerating crypto adoption um, a, across a broad spectrum. So, and definitely gaming has also benefited a lot from that. So it's a lot of uh, people at home and um, with crypto being the natively digital money and way of value transfer, um, there has been large scale adoption for sure. But I think even from um, um, looking more through the lens of gaming, We've seen for sure Axie is a really great example. So I think Axie was already on an incredible trajectory, but having the kind of the economic impact uh, that, um, and various other factors definitely contributed towards significantly accelerating the growth um, and really brought to light a lot of the economic opportunities that play to earn models are offering uh, um, in, in many different regions, but especially across the Southeast Asia uh, countries. Okay, so I think, um, I mean, I'm just going to refer, if you don't mind, some of the questions that we, we, we were talking about. And I think that probably that, I think one I'd like to, I'd like to bring in next is, um, is, is, is productive versus non-productive NFT assets. Who'd like to take that one? Um, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't all volunteer at once, guys. <laughs> no, yeah, look, I, I think it's a super interesting um, uh, realm because, you know, the original knock on NFTs was that they were just a JPEG, um, you know, figment of your imagination. You can copy and paste and, and, and you know, what makes it valuable. Um, obviously, there's, you know, loads of debating about that. And I think you either get it or you don't. But certainly um, these assets such as the axes that can be bred with or we're quite keen on a game called Z Racing, um, 
with uh, digital racehorses where you can race for prize money, breed, um, uh, sell foals, sell breeding rights, you know, the like of it. It becomes hard to um, call these um, uh, NFTs, you know, valueless when you're actually um, uh, more or less, you know, can factor in and budget um, and plan around yields that these NFTs generate. So um, certainly the space from when we were looking at it first two years ago has massively evolved um, that, you know, all assets were have gone from being sort of some sort of internet flex um, to many of them being a, um, you know, quite serious commercial enterprise in their own right. Um, and I think as that continues, you know, to evolve, um, the space is only going to get bigger and bigger and more and more commercial. Yeah, that, that, that's really actually really interesting because I, I, I um, again, I, I've got limited exposure and understanding. And one thing I have noticed, started with um, wearing a World Mobile hat, um, which is a company that I'm uh, involved with building a, an infrastructure in, 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 in uh, Zanzibar initially. Um, using cornucopias as a, as a sort of a game provider. We're looking at how um, you can use a, a play to earn game as a method of education, as well as, you know, being able to earn, whether it's data time or talk time or, or even an NFT that becomes exchangeable. I mean, we sponsored Fulham Football Club, so um, I've got sponsors of a commercial partner with them, with, with Fulham Football Club. And, so you imagine somebody being able to exchange, having earned their NFT, exchange that for an actual shirt so they can physically get something. So, so he educates it makes, yeah. makes with other stuff. So Yeah, so maybe I can chime in a little bit there. Um, I think um, to, to you guys' point, I think Julian's point, I think and initially I think this, this year has been a lot of hype and a lot of vapor where you see a lot of people just launching stuff and selling for a million dollars and whatnot. But part of what we see in Animoca across our ecosystem is that if you have the ability to to launch an a, a NFT with um, a fan base, we have the ability to to actually add utility across our ecosystem. So Animoca's ecosystem now has over 100 investments, including a lot of game portfolios. And we've seen that like of sports stars, haven't we, recently? Yeah. So I mean, instead of just the T-shirt that you're buying, like, but, you, you know, mean. where you know the people, folks like Zed Run and 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 Crypto Motors are are you know discussions of partnerships because we can now add utility to their to their to the horses to become cars because it's a standard, it's a ERC-20, right? So several conversations are, are really pushing towards interoperability uh, and uh, a multi-chain utility. Uh, and that's what we're seeing in the future. So our long thesis in NFTs are that open assets will, will change to what open source did for coding. Uh, and, and as people build communities, NFT is community designed by nature. So we think that's very powerful. We think that we're only in the tip of the iceberg of what um, programmatic NFTs will be like, uh, and the metadata is going to be really crucial how we sort of evolve into metaverses. That 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 uh, I, I'd like to direct something at Sammy on that one. I think that one of the things that has driven me more mad than anything else in the longish time that I've been involved in in the blockchain uh, crypto space is is is, is um, max maximalism. Uh, it's my absolute hate um because surely interoperability is absolutely fundamental is absolutely fundamental and that with your uh, the bsc i mean sammy would i mean you know for all of this that you're discussing you know for, to have proper adoption um you know i mean surely everyone's got to be on the same uh, well you know building bridges and ensuring that um, mm -hmm. interoperability works you don't have multi you know, if you play one game, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're on you're on PlayStation, PS4, Xbox, with all the other all the other systems. Uh, you know, surely it's got it, and, and you know, to the blockchain elements as well. So I mean, yeah, I think there's uh, several interesting uh, aspects and points here. So one is I think about accessibility, both from the developer's perspective, but also for users. I think also choice is important here. So uh, again, both for users as well as developers. And we're seeing today like a, a number of uh, blockchain infrastructures with growing adoption, but providing a number of different uh, design choices for, especially for game developers uh, with some, in, uh, some blockchains and infrastructures that are more uh, use case or, or purpose built for specific use cases and others that are more general purpose. But I, I think here, 
uh, having more choice for users and more choice for developers is quite important and where providing these more uh, these different types of infrastructure that allow developers to have different types of interesting experimentation so especially from a um, nft and gaming perspective so just touching upon some of the points that james was making so there you have um with gamers and the end users and games a, a great audience for these types of experimentation because they re understand digital asset ownership very well through uh, in-game uh, in-game assets um, and today we see a number of different types of experiments happening at where developers can do this at really low cost um, and users can also uh, share their feedback through uh, kind of like market adoption and, and various other factors. And then eventually these innovations become useful in a number of other areas, including with real world assets being integrated and used as NFTs among various other areas. Um, but I think here, one of the, the, the really key points is that we're seeing today the landscape changing quite significantly where we do see this narrative around internet of blockchains becoming a reality today with many different bridges and then games that uh, games as well as NFT marketplaces, DeFi protocols that have multiple homes and each of them catering to a larger audience. So it's providing much greater market reach as well as access on, on many different uh, on many different <laughs> and James, who hey, looks like he absolutely wants to dive in, so why don't we give yeah, it? So, a no, so um, I, I don't know if Sammy was aware of this, but we actually recently just launched this week um, uh, Formula E on uh, Binance Smart Chain Marketplace. Uh, we sold out very quickly, uh, so please check that out. Um, and, and this is exactly to the point of our discussion. Like we launched F1 Delta Time to a lot of fanfare, um, but a lot of the feedback because the community was very transparent uh, expressed to us that it became a, a whale game. You didn't have a thousand dollars. You pretty much couldn't play the game, uh, and we took that. We took that lesson, and we actually started really diving into how we can find a solution. Uh, so several weeks ago, we launched a Rev Racing uh, with our partners from Polygon. That allowed us to not only subsidize the gas fees, we went and did one better. We dropped twenty thousand cars and rewarded Rev holders to have a car with the same scarcity. Uh, and the twenty the twenty thousand cars were we worked across different partners in terms of kit crypto kitties with different different brands. With the same scarcity for trading. What we then what we then went to do is back that competition with $150,000 of rev. So top pri top 1,000 got paid out in rev. So clearly it was a massive. We saw a 5,000% and 70 increase in users. So the whole sort of blockchain gaming is still one big experiment, right? But I think what we learned from that is, you know, people are, are dying to play and learning to play. And I think as we evolve the gameplay, we do I do think that to Thomas's point, game, a fun game is still mo the most important thing. Uh, but the, the, the economics are very different in terms of how you play and compete. So we're challenging ourselves to, to try new things and failing faster, if you will, uh, and trying new experiences and working with different partners all the time. Okay, so I think that leads us to an interesting question here, which I haven't asked it already, but how gaming is a key, how gaming is a key driver for increasing crypto adoption? I, I can chime in here. So I think... Um, well, I from, hope so. It was your question. <laughs> <laughs> so from our perspective, everything that we're doing is really about driving crypto adoption. Um, and I think there's a number of key areas. Like it's kind of domain agnostic. So we've seen a lot of growth happening in, in the DeFi space. We've seen a lot of growth happening more recently in the gaming space, but more related to gaming. I think it's uh, one of the really key ways of which we're going to bring in the next 100 million and the next billion <laughs> Uh, new users into crypto for a number of reasons. So one is that it has a much wider appeal. We know that gaming market is huge. The total number of users globally is also really, really massive in terms of where mainstream gaming is today. But if we look at where crypto gaming is, although it's growing rapidly fast, there's a whole number of different challenges uh, okay. to be overcome. And there's great teams working on addressing these challenges for us. So I think we're making, as a as an industry, really great progress there. But if we look at some of the key challenges, I think today the developer experience, if we're honest, is not that great. The user experience is even worse. So, but again, to mention, there's lots of really great teams and engineers working on addressing <coughs> the tooling as well as user experience, including wallets and uh, eventually reaching 
user experiences that kind of look much more similar to the Web 2.0 experiences, but in a Web 3 environment that allow users to have really uh, uh, true ownership over their, their their assets and sometimes without necessarily having to custody their own keys and uh, through a number of different creative solutions. Um, but overall, I think the, the, the trend is quite clear in that gaming is bringing in lots and lots of new users and expect that trend to continue to accelerate. Thomas, would you like to um, add something to that? Sure. And also, um, just a reminder, James, could you turn your microphone off, please? Um, Julie, you're fine. Cool. Yeah. Um, uh, sure. This speaks to kind of a pertinent point and also sort of comes back in a little bit to the, to the whole bridge discussion before, because there is the flip side to all of this blockchain technology, and, that, and that's really, I think, what we're passionate, and I'm personally passionate, is in terms of the user experience of that. Because... Um, for blockchain gaming to become a successful, uh, to successfully take market share in the gaming industry, it's not enough that we consider how do we interest and engage blockchain users who would maybe also enjoy gaming. We have to sort of widen the scope a bit if we really want to break through and say, well, how do we interest gamers who have never heard of the blockchain? And that's sort of where you get glaring um glaring issues that really have to sort of be anticipated in terms of bridging, in terms of uh, non-custodial wallets, in terms of users having to understand how gas fees work. They have to be prepared for gas fees. They have to load up for gas fees. Uh, they're going to have crumbs and, and bits of dust in their wallets, you know, two, three dollars they didn't end up spending on fees. That's a nuisance for a, a common user or, or more sort of general user who uh, has an experience in, let's say, you mentioned it before, PlayStation Network, right? I open the store, it tells me exactly how much I'm going to pay to start playing the game. I click the button, I pay with my card, I'm done. But if I want to play Axie, for example, which in many ways is an amazing game, but suffers this same problem because it's a blockchain-centric problem. If I want to play Axie, I first have to understand how does Ethereum work? How do I get Ethereum in my wallet? How do I bridge that Ethereum to their new Ronin sidechain? Then how do I buy an Axie? Then how do I load the Axie onto my account? Then I start playing the game. And at that point, you've lost a lot of the casual players who maybe actually have a lot of money to spend in these markets, but they don't have the time to sit down and spend hours learning how it works. Um, so that's something developers really have to be conscious of in this space uh, if, if we want to actually break out and break through. Um, we've, we, we've lost... Um... Yeah, I'm, sure he'll come, yeah. I'm sure he'll come back but actually what it, it i think i think thomas that that's sort of covers slightly what are the defining inhibitors was your question but actually um i think what the one of your questions that i quite like to ask the panel and hopefully you know this will be right. hey james welcome back can you hear us okay i'm sorry i bored your computer to death <laughs> well, my, it never happened overheating, so it just shut down. Yeah, actually, I tell you what, maybe that's something that everyone could do with their dust. They could have some sort of little <laughs> funnel that you know pays for stuff. Anyway, and actually, there was a guy who did dust aid, which was a very good idea. Um, Perfect uh, timing for me to, to chime in if, if I'm welcome to jump in. So I think to okay, Tom's Jay, you can jump in. I'll give you that, and then we're going to get back to a question. All right. <laughs> So I think um, a bit, a, just a little heads up. The one that I, the one that I want to close on. Uh, so we'll do. We're going to do one. But I want you to start thinking about. One of um, one of you guys submitted the idea metaverse as a data play, which fills me full of horror. So I, I'd like to use that as our final question, sure. if I may. Um, but you jump in now, and then I'm going to ask Thomas a question, and then we're going to do that one, which will be the big finale. So no, I think I think I think Thomas I went to your to your point. I think and because DNA came from um, free to play. So we spent 10 years in the free to play sector and really was sort of massaging and learning it. And I think one of the things that we learned when we entered into the in 2017 into blockchain was we started going, we started purchasing and acquiring game studios that understood game first, right? And uh, fun games. And one of the studios that we picked up is out of Czech called a Gamey, G-A-M-E-E. -E, uh, and they have uh, hyper casual games, uh, you know, over over 30 million registered users with 2.5 million active users. And one of our sort of theses was that if we can integrate a, a tokenomics into gameplay for rewards, these people are playing for five minutes, 
But we think that with this sort of exercise and rewarding them with a the token, we have the ability to potentially educate the market and their behavior and understand what a wallet meant. They know that there's tokens inside, but they don't know that you have a token that has a fiat value. So you're effectively garnering and teaching and educating people. That now you have hanger books, right? And price discovery, game discovery. Uh, so we find this pretty exciting and we're just about to integrate the token into the gameplay. Uh, so these are some of the things that we're trying. Uh, we do think that the evolution is fun, simple games before you evolve into high fidelity, triple A and triple and triple A, double A studio games. Great, James. Um, and how many more studios would you like to buy? Um, next, next one. <laughs> Next one, and on me, thank you. Uh, Thomas, uh, one of your questions. How does blockchain gaming break out of the perceived volatility, therefore fear, surrounding crypto? Slightly answered by James, given his fairness, but um, I'd like to I'd like for you to address that in the panel, and then we'll move on to the final question. Yeah, uh, I think from my perspective, it's important to say that uh, my uh, I'm not the CTO of my company. That's uh, Wesley, who's the engineer. So I'm looking at it very much from sort of the uh, public relations side of blockchain technology and how do we sort of move it away from this, again, perceived. There's sort of a comparison between, you know, uh, AXS tokens and Bitcoin. So how do you sort of how do you break that correlation so that when Bitcoin eventually goes into another winter, then it doesn't affect you know, your gamer base, your user base, your player base. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting to look at in this space is uh, especially how we sort of back end everything blockchain technology. Um, that's uh, sort of what, what I'm very engaged in and very passionate about is saying, how do we take all this interesting blockchain stuff? Because every time I have to go and buy a new Axie, I mean, I'm integrating with MetaMask. Right. Uh, I'm working with a non-custodial wallet. I'm working with all these sort of barriers to entry to do something that should be very simple. Uh, and it all essentially hinges on the idea of this gas fee, right? That's not all of it, but it's, it's a big inhibitor to sort of making something more smooth and native is that gas fees are introduced along the way. So sort of breaking out of that whole ecosystem of having to interact with the same interfaces that you interact with when you're trading crypto is a great place to start. Finding a way to sort of bridge casual users across that technical chasm. Instead, I mean, I do agree by and large with what James said before, educate users, get them to understand the wallets are casual thing that the MetaMask plugin has become so user-friendly that anyone can use it now. But at the same time, when I'm playing a game, when I load up a game on Steam, I wanna create my account, I wanna press play game. And if I need something in order to play the game, I want the game to tell me, look, you need these things, press this button, you go straight to like our, the Steam marketplace or the in-game marketplace, you can buy them right here. We'll take your credit card, we'll take your crypto, we'll take whatever national uh, phone payment service you have. We have to get to that level where the blockchain hardcore users, you can satisfy them on the back end. You can satisfy them in menus that they go looking for. But the part of your game you present to every single user, it has to be as approachable as Counter-Strike. That's, I mean, it's not necessarily 100% feasible to do right now, but it has to be the innovation we push for and push for and push for. Because that's when you break out of this idea that blockchain is a crypto thing instead of what it actually is, that crypto is just a blockchain thing. But blockchain does a lot more than that. Mm. It helps if I take myself off me. Um, Julian, would you like to add anything to that? Um, look, without worrying too much personally on the technicalities, I think um, the great thing is is that you bring in a whole bunch of users um, and investors um, who are pegging their investment and, and their understanding um, completely separately to, um, you know, certainly Bitcoin and even... Um, Ethereum and some of the other layers that we're built upon. Um, and then when you look at, you know, most of these games as being pretty much their own little um, inbuilt economy as well, they should be somewhat resilient to, to outside factors. So, you know, in terms of everything in the crypto space compared to the rest of the world is quite a, you know, somewhat um, differently correlated asset. And, and I think that the um, metaverse investment opportunities super non-correlated or low correlated to the um, rest of the crypto space. So um, definitely um, 
from a risk perspective, adding it to anyone's portfolio makes a lot of sense um, because the, the key things driving it are different tailwinds to um, the rest of the crypto space and the rest of the world economy, I think. Well, I think you've done a wonderful job of introducing the next question. <laughs> I think if the, if the clock on my uh, computer is right, I think we've got about five minutes left to deal with this hot tomato. Um, the metaverse is a data play, which to my mind reads like, um, yeah, more like sort of uh, grabbing stuff and, 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 and it's, it's the antithesis of what I think it's supposed to be. But um, anyway, I, I would love to hear, I mean, really it's about, is, is, is this sort of for the people or is it all about making money? And is it all about, you know, how we, or is it better about, is it more about making things better? Or is it, or is this, is this a way of so the metaverse is a data play? I'm going to stop talking because I get there. I will let you guys thrash it out. So if I do, I if I jump in, you can chime in there. So I think, um, I think one of the lessons that we learned um, by you know acquiring the Pixel Studios behind Sandbox was, you know, our, our sort of thesis was that we didn't want to be uh, going back to, to a centralized sort of thinking and mentality. So we could have rested on growing Sandbox, but I think to date now, Animoca has over 12 metaverse investments. And one of the reasons why we're so sort of exploring this strategy is because we, we, we sit on the top as a content, content aggregator and IP holder. So we have the ability to really influence and, and share what we're building from a top level down to all these different metaverses. Uh, we're seeing a lot of innovation from AR to VR across different metaverse in the Philippine field. We think the commerce layer on, on metaverse is gonna be very strong. Uh, we recently invested in a, in a Web3 data layer called the NACG network uh, that will be pulling some of the data to be shared, uh, decentralized data to share with different folks to, to build. Uh, so we, we're very early, we're very excited. I think everybody's still in the building mode, uh, but our, thing, our, long, our long sort of thesis is that we think metaverse is going to be very powerful um, in terms of a social community. Um, look, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I mean as, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, I, 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 I'm, I'm quite close with um, Bozen Protocol run by a wonderful man called Justin Bannon, who's a friend of mine, and 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 he, I think he, I mean, having 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 turned um, priority past, you know, the the, the airport lounge, ironically, probably where Thomas is sitting. Have you got your priority pass ticket? Oh, yeah. Having turned that into a into into a very valuable business, I think, and then also becoming a dad, he um he 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 had that sort of like, that not midlife crisis, but, but that sort of you know light bulb moment that actually he was becoming a chief extraction officer and by that i mean you know extracting revenue probably more and more and more from from your end user and instead of nurturing and caring for your end user which i think is much more apropos to our, our lives now you know i mean especially with pandemic and and and, and the, the, the 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 glaring nature of the digital divide that has has, has, has really been exposed. I mean, World Mobile, you know, we, we, we talk about connecting the unconnected because literally half the world doesn't have access to the internet, I can say. So it sort of behoves us with the, with the haves to help the have nots. And, I, and I, like, I like to think that the metaverse situation is an area of, or a force for good. And I think that the educational aspects of it, the access to things that, that otherwise you wouldn't be able to do, Rather like you were talking, James, earlier about, you know, acknowledging the fact you accidentally created a whale game. You know, you take that back and you, you redistribute things sensibly. I mean, obviously, you know, everyone has to be commercial and I accept that. And, and, and you know, people need to make livings sensibly. But I think that we should never take our eyes off actually the ultimate goal, which is to, is to you know, the whole point of decentralization is to disrupt the, as I think Mickey Watkins likes to say, the oligopoly. Um, so you know, I mean, it, 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 I think I think there's a, there is a hybrid, surely the, that exists where co corporates and, and, and people behind studios and, 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 and innovation and uh, investment funds and all the rest of it, VCs the like, they can all all benefit from their from their day day job, so to speak, whilst helping. So, I mean, I, what does everyone want to say as a, as a sort of like a final wrap up on, 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 it's quite a hot topic and I've gone on too long, but Julian, let's have 30 seconds from you, please. Um, well, I'm sure in 30 seconds much, sorry, in, 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 um, 
40 minutes. We haven't done much justice to everything going on. We haven't talked about um, loot or end project or you know, any of the 20 other projects that I've seen being flipped on my Twitter. Um, but it's certainly an extremely exciting space to invest in and to watch grow. It seems like every week something new is happening. And so I'd say to all attendees, um, you know, it's not too late to dig your teeth in and get involved, um, you know, with a couple of months of um, of understanding and effort. You can be playing your favourite games or investing in your favourite projects. Right. Over you, Sammy. I'm going to be strict now. Sammy. Yeah, so th th thanks again for having us here. We we'll welcome uh, all the listeners to uh, come and join the BSC community channels, uh, get involved with our game developer communities, um, and follow us on Twitter to find out the latest and greatest happening in the BSC ecosystem. Thomas, before you get your plane, hurry. Yes, before I catch my plane, I, I've got a couple hours to go. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, thank you for the invite again. Uh, I'd invite anyone to come uh, talk to us on our Discord. Uh, we're at pixieinteractive.io. Uh, check out our game, our first game in development, developed on this fun first principle we're doing of, of backending blockchain and making it super accessible. It's called Northern Guilds. Uh, website is northernguilds.com. It's, it's a beautiful website made by CTO. Yeah. That's the ultimate plug. James? Yeah. You, you, you get you get the, you get the final thirty seconds. I get the last right? So, um, we, so I just want to share that uh, Animoca recently kicked off its uh, NFT accelerator called the Launchpad Luna uh, with our partners from Brink. Uh, a huge reception. We have over 130 applications. So, any folks that are very interested in the space, please feel free to learn more and you know apply because we brought together some of the top sort of mentors around the who's who of crypto and blockchain to support new initiatives. Thanks, guys. Well, um, well, that just leaves me to say thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for your time and attention. And thank you to Bowie for organizing Game On Summit 2021. I hope all of you have learned something. I certainly did. Um, and I hope that it translates well for your event. So um, thank you very much for being with us all. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Goodbye.